Thank you very much for that uh, visionary uh, um, description of the data sphere project. I want to move on quickly then, if we may, to the Yale Medtronic experience. And, and let me introduce uh, with pleasure Richard Kunz, who's the Senior Vice President and Chief Scientific Clinical and Regulatory Officer at uh, Medtronic. Thank you. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> what I want to do is share our journey for transparency. Um, this is essentially event driven, <clears throat> and I'll give you a brief history here. Uh, we have a product called Infuse, which is bone morphogenic protein used in spinal fusion. Um, <clears throat> it's indicated in 2002 for single level anterior lumbar interbody fusion. And what that means is that uh, when you have a disc problem in your lower back and uh, you've made a decision to have that um, removed, um, often the uh, treatment of choice is to fuse the two uh, bodies together. And <clears throat> bone morphogenic protein is an alternative to harvested uh, a bone graft. This was a successful product over about 10 years. <clears throat> and um, the uh, base of evidence uh, for the FDA approval in 2002 uh, was one pilot randomized controlled study and two pivotal randomized controlled studies. Now, there were peer-reviewed publications of those articles, of, of those uh, the data sets afterwards, after 2002, including additional studies done. And they included three more pilot RCTs <clears throat> and four further pivotal randomized controlled studies published after the approval by the Food and Drug Administration and beyond the evidence base in the peer-reviewed literature. All of these uh, uh, studies were sponsored and supported and funded by Medtronic. There were also studies done on, on non-ALIF indications, that is, off-label indications under IDEs, uh, for potential expansion of label, and they include two pilot RCTs and three more pivotal randomized control studies also published in the uh, peer review literature. In June of 2011, uh, <coughs> probably uh, 15 months ago, there's a major challenge that was raised <coughs> regarding the validity of all of the published literature on Infuse. Um, and the principal focus of this challenge was uh, the results presented in the peer reviewed literature um, compared to the FDA data on file in 2002 and on the general study designs and endpoint concerns and so on. So this is interesting because um, when we talk about peer-reviewed processes being the solution for what happens when data is transparent, the basis of our journey was that peer-reviewed journals were wrong. So um, this was the challenge that was made. We quickly um, <coughs> uh, looked at this challenge and uh, reviewed our data to make sure that the dossiers that we had, we could verify were true. After all, this is almost 10 years ago. And we're, con and we're convinced that the data was good and talked to the FDA immediately to, to make sure that they felt the same. And <clears throat> the, uh, the remaining challenge was focused mainly on how was the information disseminated in the peer review literature, what was our role as uh, uh, funders for this uh, therapy, and the fact that many of the authors um, on the uh, papers received large royalties uh, from Medtronic for other products that they had helped derive. So you can imagine it's, a, it's, it's kind of a large conflict of interest uh, matrix here. So within a few uh, days, because there was a large media issue raised and we were on the phone with a lot of uh, major media outlets immediately, um, <clears throat> and my, uh, my boss, the CEO of the company, uh, had this was the second week on the job, by the way. Um, so <clears throat> we had to make some quick decisions uh, very, very quickly. Um, we contacted Yale, um, Harlan Crumholtz and, and Joe Ross, who's here, uh, because of their interest in data transparency. And <clears throat> their capability to be able to coordinate a process that we thought we would be able to satisfy the public trust on. And what we announced was that we would work with Yale. Yale announced its process uh, to take our patient level data um, and send it to two independent systematic reviewers. So we agreed to supply Yale with all de-identified, and there's a long process for this and a very expensive process, and it's not scalable as we can see yet, uh, de-identified uh, data, patient-level data for all of the studies I showed earlier in the, in the, in the slide before, including all the non-label studies. We also provided all FDA correspondence and all adverse event reports, and these are thousands of reports. So we tried to make sure that there was nothing that anybody would reasonably want to have that we wouldn't supply to, uh, to Yale. Um, <clears throat> we then agreed not, so there are two levels of transparency that we wanted to work with. Our main concern was addressing these issues, because if these issues were important and had credibility, we wanted to know them and we wanted to alert the public. 
The second thing is we also wanted to make sure that we had trust with the public because we sell products that they use uh, when they're sick. And at that time, we agreed that the data would go completely transparent to two systematic reviewers for them to do an independent review. And then we wanted to take one step further uh, with collaboration with Yale to provide this into the public domain. And that process, uh, we are in the final phases of understanding how that's going to work. Um, in the fall and winter of 2012 is when we'll have the publications of the systematic reviews, and they'll be in two forms. One is a formal review, and the second will be a manuscript um, uh, that will be uh, published in each of the systematic reviewers in the Annals of Internal Medicine. Um, and we're in almost in the phases of that being submitted by the systematic reviewers. And again, we're completely hands-off in this process. Um, and uh, that's, where we, that's where we stand. The actual process for um, the transparency component that we've committed to and is going to be determined by Yale, not by Medtronic, is still in the final phases of understanding what that structure looks like. We, uh, <clears throat> I'm sure a few, a few of the Yale uh, slides about open transparency because these were what we aligned with in our theories about transparency. Um, the project, specifically for this, this project, um, it was an extension of the Yale uh, Open Data Access Program, uh, which included uh, the uh, Yaleys on the left, uh, Harlan, uh, Gary, and Joe, and then <coughs> a special um, group assembled for this Medtronic Yale project, headed by uh, Kevin Bozick and uh, Zeke Emanuel. The rationale we've gone over, uh, it's important to get uh, data out. A lot of data isn't published. Um, we wanted to both find out what the truth was address every one of the issues were raised in the challenge, and participate in the process of making data more publicly available. Um, the focus on industry is important because industry still provides the vast majority of studies that are published. Uh, we support them, and uh, there are a lot of reasons why we've all spoke about that early in the session as to why data needs to be transparent to the public. Um, <clears throat> and I'll just move on quickly for this. The goal of the project was to um, promote the notion of clinical trial access, but to work through the kinks. And there are a lot of kinks, believe me. We spent a year working through a lot of these issues about how to go forward. Um, and to bring together uh, the ecosystem of physicians and patients that can share um, in the data. Now, I'm not going to go through all of these details here, but I'll show you two work streams that both Yale had and we had just to get this project together. Um, the Yale project work stream was, one, was mainly focused on how to take the data, assemble it, and give it in the most unbiased way to two systematic reviewers to allow them to uh, analyze the data and do a full systematic review. And <clears throat> you can see that there are a lot of processes here about how to take the data um, and, uh, and send it out to coordinating centers. Um, and for reasons of time, I'm not going to go through all of these processes. They're very straightforward um, and they're logical. Um, why should industry participate in this? This is something we aligned with with Yale. Uh, it allows fair and objective assessment of product research data as opposed to speculative analysis based on incomplete data. We think that the best way indus industry participates is not to compete on how we disseminate the data, but more about how we advance our technologies. And so a level playing field, I think, does advance those individuals or, or companies that actually can advance patient care uh, and not to worry about the, uh, the, the cover or veil of uh, data uh, um, uh, and propriety. Um, Yale, as part of our contract, we want to make sure that this process, if it had bumps on the road, was going to be evident to the public. So Yale put together a handful of publications. We've had a few meetings about what it means to be transparent for all of the obvious reasons, some of which are we're all concerned about misuse of data. So we want to make sure people understand there is a possibility of misuse of data that doesn't inhibit us from getting the data out of there, but one has to start having conversation that if you start to see spectacular results from somebody who gets data, think about it for a second there because there are a lot of issues about how data is analyzed. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about the process we had to do. This is our slides. We agreed that it's important to have transparency and independence. Um, the communication process was very complicated to make sure that we communicated the, the right stuff to the uh, uh, Yale and also to the uh, systematic reviewers. We did not want to review <coughs> to send them previous reviews or interpretations of the data, including systematic reviews that had been done before by Blue Cross and Blue Shield and others, because we didn't want to bias or taint the, uh, the information. 
um, the query management process about how the data would work between systematic reviewers if they didn't understand a piece of data they got or they wanted to validate that actually the data was real and come. There were processes we had to have to make sure that they could be handled in an unbiased way that could be audited and transparent. <coughs> That had never been decided. There were, no, there were no precedents for that before, so we had to invent these. We don't know if they're the right ones. We think they're pretty good. Um, the de-identification process, we talked about that earlier, is complicated. Um, there are, specific, there are HIF, 18 HIPAA fields that have to be de-identified. We could de-identify identif de about 15 of those fields. We had to hire an expert in de-identification. Um, I'll go quickly to, and I can show you that there's, the processes were expensive and long. Uh, this took about four months to do with about 25 people uh, to de-identify these data sets. The total cost of this project is about two and a half million dollars. Um, the process also, we had to de-identify approximately 1,500 uh, medical device reports uh, from the Food and Drug Administration as well, and they had to be reviewed. We had to hire an expert, a statistical expert in de-identification and make sure that they were certified, uh, and that had to be uh, addressed with HIPAA lawyers and so on. So it's a big process. I want to get this slide very quickly. Uh, a couple concerns um, that we still have, and they're, they're not major concerns. There are issues we need to raise. And this is based on the experience we've had <coughs> in trying to do this process for over 14 months. If we make a transparent process for the data and make it available to, to the uh, uh, public, the query aspect is, do we want to know who's asking the question and why? And is there an interest in the truth? A lot of concerns about what if a litigant firm wants to get the data and they identify themselves as a litigant firm. Well, litigant firms can also find the truth sometimes. And so we know that they're incented to find things that are going to raise money. But at the same time, what's the concern about that? And we don't want to limit <coughs> somebody who wants to find the truth. But we know that there are a lot of alternative reasons to analyze data in other <coughs> than truthful approaches. Uh, what's the question? Can we have an independent group that says, is the question worthy? Does it serve the public or not? Or is this a, uh, a data dredging? Hit? And what methods um, are you being used? And should they be pre-specified? If you're going to ask a question, should you say, how are you going to answer them? And that should be reviewed by an independent panel. Access. Should there be an initial zone of propriety um, and time? That is, that should we or academia or anybody who's going to share data have at least a year so they can get their, their stuff done before it's sent out? That's not really well worked out. Anyway, I think we touched on that this morning. What level and portion of data is requested? Is it all of the data? How deep do we go? Do we go into the adverse events and so on? These are complicated. Should there be a time limit or license on data access? If we hand you the disk, are you going to keep it forever and do a lot of analyses, or are we going to license you with a question? This is what they do in the UK, by the way. They get a single question and a time period to analyze that if you get NHS data. So these aren't worked out yet. Who controls the data distribution? The methods. Are there a priori questions on hypothesis to be tested? Should we ask people, the, what is their a, a priori question? Is there an interest in data exploration? Maybe you're saying, I actually want to do a data dredging experiment. Well, should we let them, let them do that? How do, how do we control multiplicity and type one error? The analysis. Is the requester a competent to do analysis? This is something that's evaluated also by the UK. They determine whether or not someone has a track record of doing analysis. If they don't, and the question is merit, merit has merit, they will send it to somebody else, uh, and I think they contract with Bristol to do statistical analysis. And this is, has to be worked out. Um, should the analytical methods be transparent to the public? Should you list your methods and then should be tested to make sure they're there? What about secondary data sharing? Can the requester share the data? That's an issue that hasn't been worked out either. And, and believe me, that if someone gets a disk, it will be on the internet. There's no question about that. Um, and <laughs> dissemination of the results. Should there uh, be controls on the results dissemination from the secondary or primary analysis? Do we allow unfettered dissemination of the data? Or is the dissemination only after a peer-reviewed publication? That is, you can disseminate your results if you get published in a peer-reviewed journal, which isn't perfect, as we've seen, because the basis of this is peer-reviewed errors. Um, and finally, uh, what's the full methodological review required? Should you have a dispassionate person to review those reviews and so on? So these are the things that have bubbled up in our, in our feeling because we're in the middle of this for the last year or so that have driven it. And then the, my final slide is one thing I also want to address <coughs> that's important, and I hope we touch on this, is we're now being asked and to understand what is our role as industry compared to the peer review role, okay? I won't read all the things in the slide, but and the bottom line is we have a regulatory responsibility to do studies with the regulatory agency to produce those results in a faithful and trusted way and to disseminate them under the law. 
But we work with academic investigators who also publish in a sphere of peer review. And that sphere of peer review doesn't want to have industry involvement at all. So if we have investigators we work with who decide to <laughs> cherry pick uh, endpoints that they want to put into tables, um, to potentially modify the protocol and analyze what they've seen and some of the stuff that Deb talked about, what's our role to police that? Should we police that or not? Or is that a different, or should the peer review take care of that per se? These aren't worked out at all. And I think we'll probably address some of these issues if in fact some of the challenges about peer review problems or misuse of data that was challenged by uh, the principal investigator about how it was disseminated, then we will come back and say, this is a product we actually sell to people. We're responsible for the health of those individuals. What is our role in policing the academia peer review in that situation? And that's not what worked out. And I'll stop there. Thanks.